morning everyone and welcome to uh, another episode of morning coffee uh it's uh a rather gray overcast kind of saturday morning and inspired by the last episode of big punch classic i have taken this out into the garden in fact i think you can hear a magpie or something making a bit of a noise in the distance um so yeah it's been a while since we last recorded one of these and uh, it's good to be back in the saddle, feeling a little bit self-conscious about talking to myself out in the garden, but hopefully it's not too uh, too conspicuous and hopefully early enough that no one's really awake to make me feel weird. Um, so yeah, what's been happening? Well, the last episode we put up was actually um, the recording of me doing a panel at uh, Milksham. Uh, slightly sketchy audio quality, but that was uh, about a month ago now, and that was right at the start of the Kickstarter campaign for After I Think Volume 4. We'd launched uh, literally that morning, hopped in the car, uh, sped down to Melksham to start uh, to go to Melksham Comic Con. So uh, it was kind of nice in a way because I was completely detached from reality and the uh, general progress of um, uh, the Kickstarter. It wasn't worrying too much. And um, I had no kind of internet connection because the uh, town hall in which the convention was taking place was like a lead box and there was no signal in or out. Uh, so it was lovely and uh, had a little panel, uh, some people turned up, which was nice. And uh, yeah, we just talked about the Kickstarter. And now, uh, a month later, um, finally settled into a more regular morning coffee schedule so we're going to be doing these every two weeks and just like I promised uh, around the time I started doing the show and around the time I foolishly fell ill um, we're going to get some guests on and we're going to talk about all manner of stuff and this is actually going to be a show rather than an odd little fancy I just throw together at odd minutes um, so yeah probably um, maybe shorter more regular episodes until uh, you know unless we have a guest on um, but hey, so um, yeah, in a slightly rambling fashion, um, the last episode was right at the start of the Kickstarter, and this episode falls right at the end of the Kickstarter, and um, and yeah, we are we are we are funded incredibly. Uh, there are forty eight hours, give or take, to go on the Kickstarter, and I think we're at one hundred and three percent. So. We made it, so uh, if you're listening and you are one of our backers, or even if you just help share the word, spread the word, kind of tell people about it, um, thank you, because uh, I, I'm, I'm immensely grateful for being given this opportunity to make the new book a reality, because it is uh, it's expensive. Like, make, making books to a kind of level of quality I'm, I'm happy with, and to the size I'm happy with, is is expensive and it's hard work and uh, uh and yeah unless you're marvel or dc getting uh you know producing these big graphic novels is, is challenging so kickstarter is a bit of a, a lifesaver and it hasn't even really sunk in yet i don't think it will sink in until we hit what is it like 8 a.m on monday morning when funding ends or uh 7 58 a.m whatever the kind of cutoff point is um so yeah i think then and only then will i relax and allow myself uh, a moment but uh but thank you um now if you if you've been listening to um yeah sorry if i sound a bit dazed it's just because it hasn't sunk in yet uh, but i mean yeah just thank you uh perhaps I'm just gonna spend the weekend kind of quietly sitting in the corner and hoping that nothing nothing terrible happens but yeah i think we may have safely cleared our target um if you've been listening to the last um a couple of episodes of Big Punch Classic, uh, it was pointed out to me that I did nothing but talk about Kickstarter, um, which I apologise for because it maybe wasn't the forum for it, but um, if, uh, yeah, if no one minds, I thought I might take a minute to uh, have a little chat about the Kickstarter process this time around, and um, in coming shows I'm going to try and get uh, some uh, fellow creators and friends of mine who have also run Kickstarters to come on and, and talk about their experiences, because this will now be... This is now the third Kickstarter project that I myself have run. Uh, the fourth, if you include Sandwich Masters, which we did obviously through Big Punch Studios. Um, so yeah, we've got four under our belt, and I know Nick's done a couple. So collectively at Big Punch, we've yeah we we've, we've done a fair number of these now. Uh, but kind of comparing my projects, I've certainly noticed a, 
I've noticed a bit of a change in the way Kickstarter works, which I thought would be quite interesting to, to mention. So the first Kickstarter project I ever ran launched, I want to say, on like Halloween 2012, maybe, or I, I could be getting confused, but it was it was it coincided completely unintentionally with the launch of Kickstarter in the UK. I mean, um, uh, it was around the time I just started making a comic. People, uh, people were talking about, uh, you know, people were talking about let's all run Kickstarter projects. Let's all do. Let's all make our stories a reality. Let's make money and and bring these big projects to life. And uh, I was like, oh my god, yeah, that sounds like a really cool idea. I'm going to do it. And then somehow despite being inspired by all these people, I ended up beating them completely unintentionally to putting a project up. I just so happened to be the joint first uh, UK comics project on Kickstarter, along with the utterly fantastic uh, Widdishins by Kate Ashwin, who um, we should absolutely try and talk to because Kate is just a kickstarting powerhouse and I think has got the utterly perfect balance of fandom, goals and and project management like she's just she's quite incredible um but yeah so we ran the first kickstarter project for volume three of after i think lifeblood which was horribly uh structured i made a real mess of the rewards uh it you know didn't present the best deal to my backers and that was entirely my fault because of my ignorance and inexperience and i just kind of made a bit of a hash of structuring it and um but somehow with a lot of help from family, friends, and fans of the comic, we we made it happen. But that was a you know textbook case of it didn't look like we were going to make it. I had to go kind of uh, begging, knocking on doors, kind of saying, "Hey guys, could you help the comic?" That kind of thing. And um, and yeah, and it was a bit of a struggle, but we somehow just made it over our target. And yeah, the book became a reality, and I was incredibly proud of the book. And we were able to uh, you know deliver it to all the backers and. I think everyone was happier, but I learned a lot from it, and and I knew that like next time around we would do a much better job. So that project, because I'm only a writer, was not just to fund the printing; it was to fund uh, the art as well. It was to pay all the artists and cover production costs, that kind of thing. So the second project I ran uh, in April 2014 was for the Book of Life, which was the hardback collected edition of all three volumes of After I think. It was uh, nearly 400 pages, A4, beautiful white, uh, just kind of clear white hardback with a debossed After I think A on the front, and it looked gorgeous. And this was probably my Kickstarter success moment, because that one, people just went crazy for it. Uh, it was 60% funded on the first day, and fully funded in five. So... It was wonderful, and then for the rest, the next three weeks, we were just kind of coasting. Really, we we unlocked stretch goals. We got to do a larger print run. We got a, we got to do like an extra hidden story for everyone. Um, everyone got like badges. It was wonderful, and you know that that was just a gift that kept on giving. It it ran itself pretty much, and I'd taken to heart everything I'd learned from doing the last Kickstarter and all the mistakes I'd made. And the result was, I think, a fairly structured projects where you know a backer got a fair deal for what they pledged for and they weren't kind of cheated out of money you know you know every, i was happy because the book got made they were happy because they got a nice product at the end of it i think that's the key balance you need you know to balance affordability with the value of the thing you're making and kickstarter isn't a store but then it kind of is in some ways so the goalposts are always moving you just got to try and find the nicest kind of balance but I think a reason, you know, a reason uh, the Book of Life was quite so successful was because it was already made. And I don't think this is a controversial statement at all. In fact, I think so many people have confirmed it, that Kickstarter seems to work best if you have, in terms of comics at least, if you have a product or a book ready to go and you're only funding the print costs. Because I think from a backer's perspective, they can have a lot more trust and will be a lot more willing to invest in a project where the book is ready to go. There's less to speculate on. You're saying, hey guys, we've got this book, it's all in digital, maybe it was a webcomic first, or maybe we've we've just spent six months making it, and now we just want to cover the print costs. And everyone goes like, well, hey, that's amazing, because the moment they get funded, they just have to you know, click send, and then the book is made. Uh, Lifeblood, it was a bit more speculative, because we were saying, hey guys, the book isn't made yet at all, we only have our kind of 
previous track record of books one and two, but we want to, um, you know, we want to uh, pay the artists. We can, you know, do do everything. So if you're a backer, it looks like a less reliable project. You're thinking, oh heck, you know, uh, maybe maybe something will go wrong. Maybe you won't finish the script on time. Maybe the art won't get done, and then we've got to print it. So there's a lot more that could go wrong, and it looks like a riskier prospect. The Book of Life was ready to go. I even had a few print copies made up, and they look fantastic. And yeah, and it was great because we were able to show them in the video, in uh, in photos. People could, people could just say, oh, look, that's exactly what it looks like. It's fantastic. And and yeah, and I think that's why it did so well, because I think you had these kind of people just browsing Kickstarter looking for cool projects to get involved in, and they see something where it's ready to go over a physical prototypes. All they have to do is pledge, and they'll get a nice book in a few months' time. And yeah, people just uh, people just loved it. And um, I think another thing another thing that was nice was that the um, uh, the unit price of the Book of Life was was higher because it was a big, great big hardback, and it was about forty quid. And um, so one backer made more of a dent in the overall target, if you know what I mean. So yeah, that was like that was an example of perhaps kind of falling in the perfect band of you know goals and oh yeah and there's another thing you know we had the option of printing say you know 500 or a thousand that kind of thing and out of all the quotes I got I purposefully went for the lower estimate so I say look well, let's only print you know a few hundred as opposed to like you know 600 that kind of thing the idea being that a Kickstarter with a lower goal is more likely to succeed. And then if you go over that and you get into stretch goal territory, you can then start making, you know, you can aim for those kind of larger print runs. Pardon me, just coughing off mic. And um, yeah, and, and this is a very interesting psychology because you could have two projects making, they're each making a, a 22 page comic, um, exactly the same in terms of theme, size, you know, creative team. But if one project is asking for a thousand dollars and the other project is asking for five thousand dollars you know if they both make two thousand dollars after a week then one project is what you know um 200 funded and the other project is only 40 percent funded even though it's a very similar uh product and the only difference might be that one is going for a small print run and the other is going for a big print run and it's probably the case that the one with the smaller print run will ultimately make more money because it has a lower goal and this is the curious psychology of Kickstarter, where if people see that a project is succeeding earlier, they are more likely to back it, even if the amount of money it has made is overall uh, less or the same as another project with a higher goal. So it's always better to get funded earlier, or at least to um, uh, you know try and hit. Uh, there used to be this this idea, this number bandying about that if you could hit thirty percent funding in two days you would be put in kickstarter's uh, air quotations popular section which would obviously boost you to a higher audience um i don't think they do that anymore they've changed the way they structure stuff and i'm, I'm going to kind of touch on that later and why that's both like a good and a bad thing um so i mean probably the next kickstarter we ran was uh, sandwich masters which we did in september 2015 so about a year ago now and um we, uh, that was our first time we'd moved into card games and we, you know, took everything we'd learned. We did a nice structure. I thought we did a nice reward structure. We kind of looked at other games as inspiration, trying to think how did they do their page. Uh, and we launched our game. And uh, like with every Kickstarter, we got a, a nice surge kind of immediately as kind of all our fans and friends and family who knew about the game suddenly were like, oh, hey, well, we know it's coming. Bang, let's back it nice and early. So we got a good surge. And then it really kind of petered off and things got very quiet and we were struggling. We really were. Um, we realized early on that we made a bit of a mistake in putting ourselves perhaps in the wrong category. Like those are, you could be in a playing card category or you could be in the card game category. And it was a bit swings and roundabouts, kind of like some of the games we looked at, say, for example, Exploding Kittens, which is perhaps the it is the most funded card game ever on Kickstarter. So I think you could do a lot worse than looking at them. Uh, they were in uh, playing cards, so they they clearly didn't suffer for it. But we had a few backers saying, "Hey, um, you know, blah blah blah, you should uh, you're in the wrong section, you should change it." 
Uh, so we did, and we made that little switch, and um, that helped a bit. But we really were struggling, and I think we got to the end of our third week on Kickstarter, and we were pretty much convinced by this point that we weren't going to make it. Like We were really kind of limping along. I think we'd hit 60% or something like that. And then we woke up on the Sunday uh, of that kind of third week, and I looked at my email notifications, and we had hundreds and hundreds of email notifications of people backing the project, and it suddenly went crazy, and we couldn't work out why. And I was just like, in a, I was, I was really happy, obviously, but I was like, what the hell? What the hell is happening? Because we've been, it feels like we've been coming up against a brick wall in promotion, where we've been doing everything we could possibly think of to get the word out there, and it just wasn't, you know, kind of leading to anything. It wasn't translating into people backing the project. Uh, and then we realised that Kickstarter in their kind of mysterious ways, had made us project of the day. So out of every every single project on Kickstarter in every category, they said, hey, Sandwich Maskers, that's the plucky little project that could, let's give it the spotlight. So for 24 hours, we were featured on the homepage. And we made probably more in one day than we'd made in the preceding three weeks. And our project shot up and it became funded. We hit uh, stretch goals. We were able to you know, double our print run, bring out a couple of expansion packs. And it was incredible. And, you know, obviously, like, we're very, very grateful to Kickstarter for that, frankly, arbitrary leg, you know, leg up, knees up that they gave us. And um, leg up, not knees up. Yeah, that leg up they gave us. But, of course, that is not a business um, strategy, if you know what I mean. It's not a strategy to wait and hope and kind of, I guess, pray that some higher power gives you a leg up which could just as easily have been given to someone else like our project was no better or worse than another than another project our peers which were doing more successful than us but if someone at kickstarter a human being was just like hey we we like i like this project i think it's worthy of project of the day so that just kind of that exploded and you know very grateful to it but it's a double-edged sword and i'm going to kind of touch upon that now because we get we fast forward now to what September 2016, right now, the present day, and of running after, I think, Volume 4. Um, I'd been thinking about Kickstarter, going back to Kickstarter for a long time, because, as I said in the intro, making these books is really expensive, and as each book gets bigger, so too do uh, the costs. And printing isn't so much the issue as it is paying everyone involved, because I believe very strongly in paying every artist who works for me and sometimes it's you know i freely appreciate it's not say comparable with what marvel or dc or image can offer but at the same time i'm just a guy or like you know big punch we're just a small organization and we do want to treat people fairly we're very very keen to be i guess an ethical company because it's a very needy industry comics and everyone's very desperate to to get to the top whatever that means and i've seen a lot of examples of people maybe stepping over people or taking advantage of people or kind of treating people badly just to kind of you know gain some kind of foothold and climb further up so we were always very keen that we were never going to do that and we'd rather kind of be successful on our own terms if indeed that happens while doing right by everyone around us so life would be a lot easier if i was willing to maybe (laughs) not pay anyone who worked for me but hey that's you know that's the nature of the beast so the biggest expense is getting money together to pay all the artists. Now, after I think Volume 4 is inspired by the graphic novels, the American graphic novels I grew up uh, reading, like the Marvel and DC ones. So it's made up of six six chapters, six 22-page chapters. And if you factor in uh, special features and extras, the book is at 172 pages, which is the biggest book, excluding the hardback collected edition, that we've done so far. So Lifeblood was 128. That gives you some example. So, um, you know, a lot of artwork to produce. And when I ran the numbers originally, and, you know, I would really, really recommend if you're thinking of doing a Kickstarter, do a Excel spreadsheet, do a breakdown of every single cost. And, and remember that Kickstarter will take 11% of whatever you need. And, you know, you've got to, you've got to think long and hard about the target that's best for you. And I looked at it originally, and I think we were talking something in the region of £15,000 to make this book. Like, it's an incredible amount of money, for me, at least. You know, I appreciate that kind of pittance when 
you look at some larger companies, but no, it's a big, a lot of money for me and a big deal for me as well. And I looked at Kickstarter with based on those numbers, and this was a year or two ago, and I realised that with the retail price of a book being what it was, I would have to give away more copies than I was printing. So if I was trying to make a print run of, I don't know, 500 or 1,000, you know, the amount of the pledges required would, yeah, we might do it, but also we'd, we'd have no stock left at the end. So kind of what would be the point? And, um, and when we'd just be in the same hole again, we'd have to do another Kickstarter maybe to do a print run. And the margins just weren't in our favour, especially when, you know, Kickstarter are taking their share as well. So, um, and also, of course, like at 15 grand, that's a, that's a big target to, to go for if you're not, say, a webcomic. Because I think the real success stories on Kickstarter are webcomics with a massive web fan base. And it's kind of um, a comic book maker going straight for the books. I feel like I've almost missed a trick there. So it could be, you know, trying to make a shift to doing some more digital content going ahead, which is certainly why we've put the entire back catalogue of After I Think up online. But anyway, I'm digressing. So I made a decision quite early on that we could, I couldn't run a Kickstarter for the entire sum of the book. So instead, I started putting money aside. I started um, finding a bit of money each month to putting a little pot. It wasn't much, but it started adding up. And, you know, if we made particularly good sales, I'd try and put a little bit of money aside for the Man-Made God Fund, as I called it, because Man-Made God is book four. So uh, over time, I gradually started getting the money I needed to start making some of the book. Hmm. So, you know, obviously, six chapters, we could start making these chapters. We could start doing the artwork. We could start making the book now and kind of take chunks out of our total Kickstarter goal and, and run a Kickstarter at a smaller amount. Uh, another challenge was playing producer. Like, uh, it's amazing how little writing I actually get done these days because I'm always kind of doing the behind-the-scenes stuff. So it's assembling a team of artists. It's kind of finding people who are available and at the right time. You know, it's kind of it's editing. It's always kind of junk. Uh, but hey, you know, through you know blood, sweat, and tears, we actually made half the book. So we made chapters one, two, and three. Uh, with the amazing team of Ash, uh, Ash, who's returned from previous books, Ash Jackson, uh, and uh, newcomer David Tinto doing pencils, uh, Mike Bunt, old collaborator of mine, doing inks, doing a great job, and Verity Glass uh, doing colours. And Verity is actually uh, the artist on Orb, which we publish through Big Punch Studios, in addition to being a you know fantastically talented artist and colourist, working for Titan and IDW and all this kind of stuff. So got half the book made, and I thought, great, big kind of, you know, slash our kind of the money we need because we've already done bits of it. I've already managed to raise some of those funds. And I went back to, and I looked at it again, blah, 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 ran the numbers. And I realized I could do a Kickstarter for six and a half grand, which, you know, when you take off Kickstarter's 11% that they take, then, hey, I've got enough money to fund the remaining three chapters, pay all the artists, and uh, do a print run. So this was fantastic. I was I was uh, very very happy. And so um, started building the Kickstarter page, uh, taking a lot of time, learning from my betters, kind of looking at you know uh, what other projects had done, trying to structure it just right. And uh, yeah, and then we launched. And as I said, right at the start of this podcast, we went away to Melcham on the day of the launch. We basically clicked go, disappeared for the day. And we kept getting kind of updates throughout the day. People saying like, hey, you're doing well, aren't you? And I'm like, well, I, I really don't have any idea because I am, um, you know, I, I'm I'm trapped in this lead box of a convention hall. Like, I have no idea what's happening in the outside world. And um, so, yeah, it was kind of, that was like quite pleasing in a way. It was nice to disconnect and it was nice to hear word of mouth, people coming up and saying, hey, you're doing well, aren't you? You're doing well. This is great. And it did feel great. And that was exactly the kind of boost we needed. And I think we made something like 1,000, oh, I don't know, like 300 or something in the first day. I probably got that wrong, but we had a great kind of boost. And I was like, this is amazing. Like we're, we've made like 15, oh, my maths is a bit shonky, but we've made like 15% of our overall target in a day. Like this is incredible. Like maybe we'll be funded in a week, you know, all these kind of things you're, you're kind of dreaming of. And um, instead, uh, it kind of petered out and petered out rather uh, kind of, rapidly so we went from being uh you know that amazing kind of first day spike to uh 
tapering out and then it became a slower climb and we made a few hundred on the next day and maybe like a couple of hundred the next day and it just kept kind of like limping on and that was when around the time some of the like kind of alarm bells start kind of start, started ringing in my head and I was thinking oh heck what am I doing you know what am I doing wrong that was that, that was a thing where you think I, I, I'd worked so hard at this like I tried so hard to kind of get it perfectly you know uh, perfectly aligned structured and everything uh, I just didn't know what what more I could do and I, I was really I, I have spent the last kind of month really um doing my best to publicize it, talking to blogs, talking to, you know, doing some interviews, um, social media, doing everything we could uh, to kind of spread the word. And still, we were kind of just eh, you know, making progress, but not kind of insanely good progress. We we're just kind of limping along. And um, uh, yeah, and, you know, it, we hit kind of a two week mark and we were just about at 50%. And I was like, okay, so we're kind of on track, I suppose, to maybe hit 100% right on the last day. Uh, but yeah, it was a real struggle. And I, for the longest time, I didn't think we were going to make it. And of course, my family and friends have been very supportive. They kind of put money in as well to try and help us along the way. And then, you know, kind of in the last week, we had that kind of boost from, you know, close family. And then in the last week, I thought, well, you know, we're in the final stretch now. We might be able to make it. And... Yeah, incredibly, you know, as is always the way in the last week when you get this kind of surge, you get a you know a big boost of interest at the beginning, you get a big boost right at the end, and it, um, yeah, we we somehow made it, we somehow hit our goal, and that was a couple of nights ago. We, um, I was preparing to do an update, and uh, Nick suddenly said, "Hey, you do realise you're a pound away from your goal?" And I thought that's really odd. Like, and I had I have a suspicion that someone someone must have you know one of my backers must have looked at it and gone, "Oh wow, like." he's so close, maybe I'll kind of put some, you know, put some extra cash in. But it wasn't that. It was actually, we looked at the backer report. It was actually genuinely just people had, people I didn't know had just suddenly gone, oh, I like this project and, you know, sent, you know, all started backing at once. So Nick very kindly increased his pledge by one pound, which took us over our goal. And um, yeah, and then in the last, we're in kind of like that, literally like the, I don't even call it now, the epilogue now, where it's just less than 48 hours to go. And uh, yeah, we've just had a few more pledges. So I think we're at 103%. So I'm, you know, I, I'm amazed. It's kind of, it's a real, you know, it's a real relief to have made it, but it hasn't even really sunk in yet because it's such a hard month kind of working on this and uh, promoting it and trying, you know, not to lose your mind through stress because it can be very depressing when you realize like, what are we doing wrong? It's not that, you know, it's not that you look at one project and you look at another and you think, well, I'm better than that. Why aren't I? I'm better than that project. Why aren't I succeeding? It's not that. It's more a case of you look at these two projects and you realize that my project is no better or worse than theirs. And if you kind of have this idea that Kickstarter is an even playing field and that you should all go on and be judged on your worth and you think, well, I, I should have just as much right as they do, or I should be getting just as much attention. And it's very hard to talk about this without sounding entitled. You don't want to say that like, oh, damn it, people owe me money. But you can't help but wonder what's kind of going on behind the scenes because Kickstarter now has this um, projects we love section, which has replaced some of their previous sorting hat kind of things. Mm. And how this works is that now a member of a Kickstarter staff can assign a blue heart to a project, which is like a little little stamp of approval saying, hey, um, I work for Kickstarter and I just quite like this project. And the moment you get like a blue heart, you get kind of pumped, uh, you get kind of um, bumped up into the popular section, which means that you get featured first in your section. So when you go to comics, the first thing you see is projects we love. And uh, we didn't get one of those. Uh, and I remember looking at one point at like the kind of breakdown of all the popularity. Like, you know, how which projects are getting the most money. And of course, we weren't by any way you know, at the top. We were kind of like down in the 20s or something. So still kind of like, you know, up there, which is a real, you know, real honor. But um, it was interesting. Like all our peers, like everything kind of which was doing well seemed to be a project we love apart from us. And I realized around the time we were struggling that my best hope would be to be made a project we love because you would suddenly get so much more attention rather than kind of because we were kind of like languishing in the search 
engine, whatever, like Kickstarter's kind of algorithms for sorting things. And I genuinely think that people just weren't seeing us. And this is the start of what we saw in Kickstarter. Uh, sorry, Game of Words model. This is kind of what we saw when we were doing Sandwich Masters. It was, this was like how it was going to lean that way. And we noticed in like the span of two years, there's a lot more kind of third party companies kind of contacting you out of the blue now saying, hey, if you give us $500, we'll guarantee that you'll get a thousand backers, that, that kind of thing. Like really mercenary kind of like, you know, parasitical companies trying to make a money, trying to make money off what ultimately should be quite a free and wonderful expression of creativity it's a bit naive because ultimately it's about money but you you know what I mean it should just be an idea for getting things off the ground and I found that when the really successful projects now are run by bigger companies or they're run by um, big uh, webcomic collectives like I know that um, Hiveworks which has an audience of tens you know hundreds of thousands of um, of people um, if you are part of the hive, as it were, if you're part of this collective, they will run and manage your Kickstarter for you if you want. And they've got very good at, at running these incredibly polished, um, polished campaigns, which are saying like, "Hey, we're trying to raise tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands to do these massive print runs, you know, to go global, to go national, to cover all of the US." And and to think that we were just kind of you know, I'm just a guy. I'm just one kind of guy running a project, and it's very hard to compete. And it's not a. I guess it's not a competition. It's not a. It's not about one person winning over another, and it's certainly not about, um, you know, becoming the best project. That's not the problem. Like, if someone backs one project, they're not taking money away from you. But at the same time, it's becoming harder to become noticed and I think in certainly online and certainly with the way Kickstarter works that's your biggest currency it's how you spread the word it's how people find out about you because you could have the best damn projects in the world but if no one knows about your website if no one reads your book then what's the point uh so yeah it's kind of it's, it's becoming very hard now and certainly when you know you have larger publishers even larger publishers turning to Kickstarter and running Kickstarter campaigns to make a book, which is something where I don't entirely know how to feel about that because there's nothing to stop them doing it. But it's like everything, when I started out in comics, my my belief was that the way to make a comic was to get a publisher. You know, you, you, you impress the publisher, they picked you up, they published your book. You didn't have to worry about any of the business kind of stuff. I learned very quickly that that's not exactly how it works nowadays and really this is the age of doing it yourself and the reason that smaller creators like myself turn to Kickstarter is because we don't have the resources of a publisher so when you see like a really large publisher turning to Kickstarter to make a book I don't know how to feel about it I feel well what 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 am I meant to take from this that either you are clearly not as successful as I thought in which case is this not a case of the emperor's new clothes and you know, all this hubbub about being a big successful company, is that not the case because you don't have the money to put into it? Or is it B, maybe you do have the capital up front to make this book, but you don't believe in it and you're thinking, well, let's kind of do some market research? Or or is it like, well, we could fund this, but why would we when we can turn to Kickstarter and have the fans prepay for it and then we get to sell it again at the end? So I don't know, it's it's quite... It's quite dispiriting because I know that if I was a publisher, if I was a publisher of that size, and if I had the capital, I wouldn't be going to Kickstarter. That's kind of the whole point. Like, if I had the money up front to make this book, which, and the money I need to make this book is pittance compared to what some of these people are asking for. Like, I'm not asking for tens of thousands. I'm not asking for hundreds of thousands. I'm just asking for a few thousand to try and make this book, which I otherwise would not have the resources to do you know, on my own. I'm trying to make this a reality. So, I don't know. It's I'm incredibly grateful to all my backers for taking us to, um, you know, 100%, to taking us past 100% and to making meaning that I can make this project a reality because it is hard and it is hard on you. You know, you have this book you want to make and you want to make it to a certain level of quality and you really want to do the best you can and um, Kickstarter is a lifesaver. So, you know, thank you all for making this possible. But at the same time, it does make me think long and hard about 
whether I want to go to Kickstarter again. Because unless something significant changes between now and then, and maybe I I am successful in building a, a web community for after I think, or if, I don't know, I don't know what would change. But at the moment, I don't think Kickstarter is favouring um, the small creator anymore, unless you get that kind of arbitrary hand of God coming down and saying, hey, you're a project we love or you're project of the day. But kind of waiting for these handouts is not, that's kind of not a business strategy. It's not a business strategy to just hope that some kind of fairy godmother comes down and says, hey, we're going to pluck you out of obscurity and and kind of um, and make you famous or, you know, make your, you know, suddenly get thousands of people supporting your book. I mean, it's kind of, this is the age of doing it yourself. And Kickstarter used to be this incredible tool. And now I'm, I'm not so sure. I don't want to say that it's going commercial, but it, it does feel like it's going commercial and it is now favoring the larger projects because there's a hell of a difference between a project being run by a company with even more than one employee, a company with a marketing team, with a marketing budget, strategy, with you know the resources to reach people on so many different mediums and then just, you know, a team of one, two, or a handful of creators just trying to make, desperately trying to make a book. And, yeah, I used to think that if you had a good product, the work would speak for itself. But I don't think it's that simple anymore. It's Yeah, I guess it's fine to speak for yourself, but when the person next to you is kind of shouting it from the rooftop with a megaphone, it's a lot easier to get drowned out. So, yeah. I think uh, food for thought anyway, and I'm hoping on uh, kind of future episodes uh, to get some other Kickstarter, uh, I guess, veterans on to kind of talk about their experiences. But um, yeah, anyway, look, I hope this doesn't sound too negative. I'm merely thinking for the future. So yeah, may rethink the old Kickstarter strategy in the future. Believe me, it'd be very nice to never have to turn to Kickstarter and just to be kind of independently successful and, you know, balanced and emotionally satisfied and, uh, you know, a successful adult. But um in the meantime, I maybe have to think of an alternative. So, yeah, I guess in signing off, thank you once again and genuinely from the bottom of my heart to everyone who put their support behind After I Think Volume 4. Uh, really, really meant the world. And I can't wait to finish off this book and make it a reality and deliver it to you, you fine people. So thank you all, and I'll catch you next episode. This podcast, and others like it, is made possible thanks to our wonderful backers on Patreon. To support Big Punch Studios as we make comics, like Afterlife Thinking Semistring, games like Sandwich Masters, and podcasts like the one you've just been listening to, head on over to www.patreon.com forward slash Big Punch Studios. For just $5 a month, not only will you help make everything we do a reality, but we'll also send you four copies of Big Punch magazine a year. That's over 180 full-colour pages of comic action, featuring Cuckoo's Orb, 99 Swords and Catamaran, delivered straight to your door. This has been a Big Punch Studios production. For all things Big Punch, be sure to head on over to www.bigpunchstudios.com.